Well, I trust that you just didn't do Christmas this year. I trust that you were actually able to be at Christmas and that you were able to live out the principles of Christmas at home, at work, and in your neighborhood. That, that's, the, that's the theme that we've developed all week long. And I trust that you had a great Christmas. We did. Um, our, our oldest son, Justin, and Jenny, his wife, and our two granddaughters flew in from Guatemala, and we were able to spend the week with them. And so all week long, I have played with dolls, and I played tea party over and over and over again, and we played doctor and patient. The good news is that I've been examined by my four-year-old granddaughter, and I'm told that I'm in perfect health. And so I want you to know that she's checked me over and over and over again, and she's told me that I'm in great health. And so uh, I trust that you've had a wonderful time with family as well, and I'm glad you're here. Many of our church family are gone. Many of, many of our leaders are gone, and so let's be praying for many folks as they uh, travel back in the coming days and in the coming weeks. Pray that God brings them back safely. Well, after a uh, week of Christmas celebrations, probably most of us feel physically heavier and maybe financially lighter. Does anybody else feel that way? By, by that I mean that uh, your stomach might be just a little fuller, but your wallet is just a little lighter, and so it might balance out just a little bit. We are, we're finishing today, as I mentioned, a four-week series that we've simply titled Be Christmas. And we've talked about four or five different practical truths that we can apply to our lives. The first one is this, worship fully. And we saw the idea that worship is not something that we just do on Sunday morning, but worship is something that should be a part of our lives 24-7. Every day of the year, every hour of the day, our lives should be one of worship to God. We saw the importance of giving generously, and Pastor Jose brought a, a great message that outlined what type of person do I need to be in order to live a generous lifestyle. Brad brought a great message on loving everybody loving unconditionally, and I, I can't think of a more apropos Christmas topic because God loves all of us regardless of our background, regardless of how good or bad we are. He came and he unconditionally loves us, and we in turn, in response, should love others that way. We saw the importance of believing wholeheartedly last week. You actually can't become, you can't be Christmas until you actually believe the truth of Christmas. Well, today we want to take one final topic as we deal through it, and it's probably a little bit of a personal topic, but we're going to talk about the importance of spending less, spending wisely making sure that that which God gives us control over use of, that we use that for his honor and for his glory. Now, 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 let me just give a disclaimer from the very beginning, all right? You're probably out there and you probably think, Brian, the, my least favorite topic when I come to church is when the pastor talks about money. Well, if it's any consolation, the least favorite topic that I like to talk about <laughs> is money. So I don't want you to sit back and think, oh my word, they relish this opportunity. No, but at the same time, this is a topic that the Bible frequently discusses. I also want you to know that our purpose this morning is not to beat you up for your Christmas spending and sit back and say, oh my word, you spent way too much. Let me tell you how you violated all kinds of biblical principles. That, that is not our purpose this morning. Rather, with the soon arrival of the new year in just a few hours, this is a great time for us to evaluate our lives. It's a great time for us to evaluate our spending habits and to make decisions that will enable you and me to be better stewards of the money that God has given to us. I mentioned just a few moments ago that money is not an extra biblical topic. To the contrary, the Bible talks about it very, very frequently. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke about money more than just about any other topic. Sixteen of the 38 parables 
are concerned with how to handle money and possessions. In the Gospels, it's amazing. One out of every 10 verses in the Gospels deals with your and my finances and how we administrate those. 288 verses in the New Testament deal with our finances. It's amazing that the Bible offers 500 verses speaking about the topic of prayer, which we all would agree is an important subject, right? There's just a little bit less than 500 verses that deal with faith. And all of us would say, man, faith, isn't that the most important topic of the Bible or one of them? Just a little under 500 verses deal with faith. There are 2,000 verses in the Bible that speak on money and speak on our possessions and speak on how we should use them. Here's the point, the point that we wanna make, I'll tell you what it is right from the very beginning, the point is this, how we handle our finances is important to God. How you handle your finances is important to God. And how I handle my finances is important to God. And I know it's personal. It's something we don't like to talk about. It's something that we want to keep private. It's something that we don't want anyone else to know. But the bottom line is this. God already knows how you're spending your money. And God already knows how I'm spending mine. And so he gives us principles in his word to guide our use of what he has given to us. So let me start with just four basic financial truths. This is, this is stewardship 101, and then we'll dive into a passage this morning. Four basic truths. The first is this. Money is not evil. <laughs> Can I get an Amen. Money's not evil. Sometimes we sit back and people say, no, 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 Brian. The Bible says money's evil. Money is the root of all evil. That's not what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.10. Paul says what? He said is the love of money that is evil. It's not money in and of itself. Money is immoral. It's how you and I use it. It's like somebody coming up to me and saying, Brian, chocolate cake is sin. Now, now, if that was the case, I would be in big time trouble. I might be like the biggest sinner in our congregation, all right? There is nothing sinful about chocolate cake. If you make a wicked chocolate cake, I would love to taste it, all right? Because there is nothing wicked about chocolate cake. Chocolate cake becomes a problem when I what? When I take what is good and I what? I abuse it. When I sit down and what? Eat the whole chocolate cake at one sitting, all right? Or, 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 or maybe eat more than I should. That's the same way money is. Money is not evil. Money is a tool that God gives to each and every one of us. Here's the second truth that I really want you to catch because sometimes we have an erroneous concept. The second truth is this. Being poor does not make you spiritual nor does being rich make you carnal. So sometimes we have this erroneous concept that God loves the poor people more than he loves the rich people. And all of the poor people honor God, and all of the rich people are people that are just selfish, and they don't honor God. Listen, it's not what you have that makes you more or less spiritual. It's how you use what you have. Uh, I know some incredibly wealthy people that love God with all their heart, their soul, and their mind, and they're extremely generous with what God has given them. On the other hand, I know some, some poor people who, instead of depending upon God and trusting in God as they should, they reject God, and they don't even honor God with the little bit that they have. Being poor doesn't make you spiritual. Being rich doesn't make you carnal. Here's the third principle I want you to catch. If you get this one, it'll solve a lot of problems in your life. The third principle is this. Everything that you have belongs to God. That's the idea of biblical stewardship. 
Everything we have belongs to God. Here's a couple of verses. We'll put them up on the screen. We could mention a lot of them. Proverbs 24 and verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 50 and verse 10. Every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. He says later on, all the gold is mine, all the silver is mine. Here's what God is saying. I am the owner of everything. And so everything that I have, everything that you have, doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to God. Now now, now let that sink in your mind and heart, because the thought that God owns everything is a sobering thought. And it certainly handles, if we get that truth, it affects the way that we handle money. And so the idea is this. If God really owns it, then I am responsible to him for how I spend the money that is allocated to me. So, so, so I'm not just responsible for the amount that I give to him. That's what sometimes we sit back and think, okay, all right, God, I know what I'm supposed to do. This part is yours, but the rest is mine, and I can handle this any way that I want. No, no, it's not that 10% belongs to him and 90% belongs to us. Catch this, church. 100% of everything we own belongs to God. And you only have it because he's given it to you. And any moment he wants to, he can take it away from you. So that means that every dollar that I spend ought to have some sort of eternal purpose attached to it. Man, don't, don't misunderstand me. doesn't mean that I need to give everything to the church. That's not what we're talking about today. But it means that I just need to wisely use what God has given to me. How wise would you say it would be today if, if I got my paycheck and I called Vicki and I said, hey, Vic, we got paid today. And she's like, great, where are you? I'm at Dairy Queen. What are you doing at Dairy Queen? I'm eating a lot of ice cream. And I went home and I spent every dollar that we had on ice cream. Now, I could look at her and say, hey, Vic, I worked I worked two weeks for that money. I earned that. I have the right to spend that any way that I want. And she would look at me in a loving way, say, you're sleeping on the couch tonight, right? Or or something like that, right? Sometimes that's the way we treat God. We treat God as if, okay, God, this little bit is yours. The rest is mine. Now I can do with it whatever I want. So here's the fourth principle before we jump into our passage you are expected to wisely use the resources God has given to you. And I am expected to wisely use the resources that God has given me. Knowing who is the source of all things shows us how to use the things that God has given to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, I'm not sure whether I put it up on the screen. The apostle Paul says this, It is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And the simple truth is this. You and I have been blessed and honored by God to be a steward of that which he has given to us. And our responsibility, very simply, in one word is this. It's faithfulness. To faithfully use and administrate what God has given to me. So, four principles, real quickly. Four principles. Money is not evil. Being poor does not make you spiritual. Being rich does not make you carnal. Everything that you have belongs to God, and you are expected to wisely use those resources in a way that honors and glorifies him. So having said that, take your Bibles with me today and turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, I want to read a very familiar passage of Scripture, and I want to apply it maybe in a little bit of a different way today, a way that I trust will be extremely helpful and extremely practical to you. And I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be very, very basic today. You might sit back today and say, man, Brian, those are all things that I am doing 
I, I stop and say, praise the Lord that you're doing them. But, but I would venture to say at some point, some of the truths that we're going to talk about today are going to hit you because they have hit me and they're things that Vicki and I are working on in our life. So Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, you know, this is the parable of the prodigal son. So would you read it with me today? Verse 11. And he said, and Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And the father graciously divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So here's this, here's this rich son who uh, was from an extremely wealthy family who grew up in maybe opulence, maybe luxury, at the very last, least comfort. And he finds himself in a difficult situation because of misusing that which he had. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worried that he be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And they began to celebrate. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Lord, for just a few moments. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to kind of set our, our, our celebrating aside and our, our, our vacation aside. And Lord, help us to focus on you. Lord, Lord I know this is, a, is an uncomfortable topic, but Lord, if we can wrap our arms and our mind around this truth, it literally can transform our families. It can transform our financial situation. It can free us up to be more involved in the work of God and to live a generous lifestyle. So Lord, I pray you'd help us to learn just a few practical truths, Lord, that that if we apply to our lives, Lord, will enable us to be better stewards of that which you have given to us. And it's Jesus, in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So I mentioned I kinda wanna take this story from a different angle today. Now, without a doubt, this is one of the greatest stories, one of the greatest parables in the New Testament. There's no doubt this is my story. This is your story. Because we were the prodigal son, we were the prodigal daughter who ran away from God, and we were the one who who came back to God realizing our sin and not deserving anything, and God the Father in his graciousness opens up his arms and he gives us, he graciously gives us what you and I could never ever deserve. So this parable talks about the consequences of sin. It it talks about the love of the father. And by the way, we call this often the parable of the prodigal son. I, I, I prefer to call it the parable of the loving father because the father is mentioned more than the son in this message. It's a parable of God demonstrating his love for us. This parable demonstrates the extent of God's grace that you can never run too far away from God. You can never sin so much that God in his grace will not receive you back. There are so many deep truths in this story that emulate the truth of the gospel. But within this story, we find some extremely practical and relevant truths about how we should manage that which we receive from the Father. You see, just as the prodigal son, as we know him, received an inheritance from the father, everything that he had, everything that he spent came from the father. 
The Father was the source of everything that he had. So as we've seen this morning, everything that you and I have come from the Father as well. Obviously, the prodigal son was extremely foolish with his inheritance. But his irresponsibility, and that's a really important word because it's a word that if we're not careful, we exemplify in our lives as well. His irresponsibility teaches us some practical truths about how we should manage our finances. So so would you indulge me for just a few moments and let me share just some, some really practical truths with you that have helped us as a family, and I trust will help you. The first thing that I wrote down as I read through and prayed through this story, the first admonition is this, do not value money more than relationships. Often we're guilty of doing that. Do not value money more than relationships. Somehow, money mattered more to this young man than his family relationships. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Notice verse 12. You notice verse 12 again, so he goes to his dad. Remember, he's not even the oldest son. So, so, so the oldest son receives the largest portion. He's the youngest portion, he only, or his youngest son. He only gets half of what the older son got or would receive. But he has the audacity to go to his dad, who was the owner of everything, and demand his dad. He says, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. The New Living Translation translates it this way. Dad, I want my share of your estate before you die. As you can imagine, his statement to his father was incredibly insensitive. Here's what the son was really saying. And remember that that the inheritance wasn't his until what? There was something that had to happen before the inheritance became his. The dad had to what? Die before the inheritance would become his. And so basically, he's looking at his father saying, Dad, I can't wait till you're dead. Give me my money. Or as one modern translation put it this way, give me my money and drop dead, old man. Incredibly insensitive. Biblical scholar and anthropologist anthropologist Ken Bailey says that there is no other example in Middle Eastern culture, past or present, Arab or Jew, of a son asking for his inheritance before his father's death. He said it was completely unheard of, this anthropologist. And the reason he states that is because it is too shocking to consider. No son in Middle Eastern culture would ever, under any circumstances, ask this. It was an unbelievable insult to their patriarchal culture. It was unimaginable that somebody would put money before relationships. So I sat back and thought in my mind, okay, how does this apply to us? Okay, you're maybe like me. I'm not expecting a huge inheritance from my parents or my in-laws. You know, we're not sitting back counting the money. I don't know how. My dad intentionally has kept it from me. So maybe there's a large nest egg right there, and he just doesn't want me to know what it is, all right? And so that's not applying to my, applied to my life, nor is it to yours. But, 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 but please follow me. Indulge with me today. Because if we're not careful, I believe in our modern culture, there are ways that, that we commit the same atrocity. There's ways that we value Money, success, job, more than relationships. And I would dare to say that there are ways that we sin against our family members just as this young man sinned against his father. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? We work long hours to the detriment of our family. I'm not saying don't work. I'm not saying don't do the best job that you possibly can, but how many dads, how many moms, how many parents have pursued a career as their number one goal and in the process they lost a relationship with son or they lost a relationship with the daughter? Listen, 
When that happens, what do we do? We put something, we put this material goal, something that we're trying to obtain ahead of our relationships. And by the way, it's, it's, it's just not done in the secular workforce. I know, I know scores of pastors who lost their kids because they put their ministry, they put their job, they put attending to others ahead in front of attending and taking care of their own family. I think one of the truths that we can learn from this parable is do not put money before relationships. Dads, do you bring your work home with you? (laughs) There's a saying, leave the briefcase at the door. And there's a reason for that, because if we're not careful, we bring work home with us and we're unattentive to our kids. We don't have time to play catch. We don't have time to play dolls and tea party and all of those things that we do with our grandkids. We don't have time to do it with our kids because we're so actively involved in pursuing success and pursuing the American dream. Don't take your work, your frustrations out on your family. I sat back and thought, what is the best advice I could give to somebody who was struggling with that? Somebody who puts work in front of family. Somebody who puts, you know, career goals in front of relationships. And the wisest advice I could get all of a sudden, of course, you have to understand my my simple mindset. Anybody remember Bob Newhart as the psychiatrist? Anybody remember that? And Bob Newhart has this famous episode where someone comes in with a serious problem. This lady has a phobia, and Bob says, I'm going to solve your problem in two simple words. Listen to the words. Take out a pencil and write them down. And the lady takes out a pencil, and she writes them down, and he looks at her, and he says, stop it! (laughs) And she says, what? He says, stop it! Stop doing what you're doing. Listen, uh, very simplistic. But today, if you're putting money ahead of relationships, if you're putting career ahead of your, uh, ahead of your kids, if your marriage is on the rocks because you're spending more time with coworkers than you are with your spouse, here's the admonition today. Stop it. Relationships are more important than money. This young man blew it. Stop making money, career, and success more important than your family. I promise you, you will only regret it. Here's the second practical truth. The second practical truth is this. Don't spend your money on reckless activity. Don't spend your money on reckless activity. Verse 13 says this. It it simply says that he squandered his inheritance. That word squandered is a word that we understand. It, it means literally to pour out wastefully. It comes from the root word, which means to scatter in the wind. The way that this young man spent his inheritance was like somebody walking away from an inheritance, abandoning it, just completely living it. The ESV translates it reckless living. The NASB says loose living. The King James says riotous living. And the NIV says wild living. So in other words, this guy took what his father had given him And he used it in a reckless, wild, riotous, loose living sort of way. Later in the parable, the older brother describes the younger's lifestyle. And in verse 30, he says this, uh, talking to the dad, he says, But when this son of yours who who, who came devoured your property with prostitutes. The word devoured has the idea of eating it up until it's finished, to consume it with a voracious appetite. The idea was that this young man took this inheritance for which his father had worked over a lifetime, and he voraciously, he quickly consumed it. He devoured it. He blew it very quickly. He squandered it with riotous living. Can I give you just a couple of really simple applications to that? The first is this. Sin is costly. Is it not? Sin is costly. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. I, I say often, I can't do it. I would never do it. But as I sit across the desk from, 
for a man who's been unfaithful to his wife and is, he's broken and he's crying and his family is destroyed. There's times that I wish I could film that and I could play that to every husband who ever considered being unfaithful. Why is that? Sin is costly. It will cost you much more than you are willing to pay. Man, this guy had it made. He went into a far country. He had all kinds of friends. Man, he was popular. He was throwing parties. He was buying beer. I mean, he was buying, I mean, this guy had the, the dream lifestyle until he squandered it. He lost in a very short period of time everything his father had given to him. The the next thing I wrote is this, squandering is irresponsible. It's irresponsible. He took what the father had given him and he spent it in an irresponsible way. Think with me, this young man not only lost a significant amount of money, which obviously it's a parable, we have no idea how much he supposedly lost, but he frivolously wasted away his future. He not only spent it in the present, but he wasted away his future. I'm reminded of the words in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 21, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. Can I give you just a a practical piece of advice? Enjoy life. I believe with all of my heart, God wants us to enjoy life. I don't think God wants us to sit in our homes and sit on the stacks of money that we have and not enjoy it. Enjoy life, but be careful how much you spend on entertainment. God doesn't want you to blow everything he has given to you in just a few days or a few hours just to enjoy life and to blow it irresponsibly. There's a word for that. It's called immaturity. We don't want our kids to do that, and yet at times we as adults do it as well. If you're spending instead of saving, that's irresponsible. If you're living for the moment, Instead of living for the future, you were on the road to financial difficulty. Do not squander what God has given to you. Can I say, and maybe this doesn't apply to anybody, but I've never ever ever mentioned this from the pulpit, and if I'm ever gonna mention it, now's the time to mention it. So let me mention it. Avoid the lure of gambling. Man, Haven't we all dreamed of winning the lottery? I I think all of us have sat back and dreamed of winning the lottery. I don't know how many people tell me, Pastor Brian, if I win the lottery, I'm giving a lot of money to the church. And I sit back and I want to say, well, go play as much as you want to then. (laughs) Obviously, we don't avoid the lure of that. I understand there's no specific verse in the Bible that says gambling is is a sin, and I can't say that it is, but let's be honest. As stewards of God's resources, gambling is not a responsible way to manage God's money. I'm not talking about the occasional lottery ticket, but I'm talking about habitually and constantly taking your resources and using them irresponsibly. I actually did some research on the odds of winning the big prize in the lottery. So so the recent big lottery, the odds of you winning are one in 22 million to win. You are 10 times more likely to get struck by lightning walking from your car into the store to buy the lottery ticket than you are to actually buy the lottery tickets. I know there's a a lure there, but, but, but I'm saying be careful. If that's becoming addictive in your life, if that's becoming habitual in your life, be careful with that. Listen, I I would also add, and I'm probably stepping on toes, and so this is my one shot to do it, so I'm gonna do it, all right? Be careful how much you spend on the shopping network. I know you look at that, and and I watch it, and, 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 and I think... Uh, I mean, I love Invicta watches, and I, I watch it, and I think it's only $150, and I can make five different payments on it, and so it's really not going to cost me anything, and yet purchase, 
after purchase, after purchase, and there's nothing sinful about an evictive watch. There's nothing sinful about what you buy. It's when all of a sudden that begins to affect the resources that God has given us is when it becomes a problem. Don't spend your money on reckless activity. Can I give you a, a third principle today? And we see it in the passage. Wisely anticipate difficulties in the future. But verse 14 says, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and all of a sudden he began to what? He began to be in need. Here's what I think, and I know it's a story, but, but I think he could see his bank account dwindling. But I believe that he told himself, he convinced himself, listen, times are good, I get it. When my inheritance runs out, I'll get a job. No problem. I can take care of myself. But here's what he didn't anticipate. He didn't anticipate a famine coming. He didn't anticipate inflation coming. He didn't anticipate a dearth in the job market. And all of a sudden, because of squandering what he had and not preparing for the future, he found himself in an extremely difficult situation. The Bible spends time talking about that. James chapter 3, or 4, verses 13 and 14 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. He says this, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And we end 2017 on a high note. And we begin 2018 with a sense of anticipation. But there's not a single one of us here today that really know what 2018 holds for us. And so it's, it's wise for us to prepare for the future. Think of all the unplanned things that can happen. Doctor bills, car trouble, a car accident, an unplanned pregnancy, an illness, the loss of a job. Obviously, there's no way that you and I can plan for every situation, but a wise planner makes allowance for what? The un expected. Our culture tells us to do the, diff the, the opposite. We're encouraged to live for the moment. We're encouraged to go for the gusto. We're encouraged, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You, you just live for today. And that's reflected in the way that as Americans we manage our finances. It's reflected in the way that we as Christians manage our finances. 50% of Americans don't have $400 in the bank to cover an emergency or an unplanned expense. 50% of our country. 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. Here's what the Bible says, Proverbs chapter 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard, Consider her ways and be wise. Without having a chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and she gathers her food in harvest. What is the writer of Proverbs telling us? The writer of Proverbs is saying, prepare because winter is coming. Prepare. There will come a difficult situation in your life. You will have a problem in your life. You will have a refrigerator that breaks down. You will have an air conditioner that goes. You will lose your job. You will have an illness. You will have a family member that will pass away. Prepare for the future. It's the wise person who prepares and the unwise person who lives for the moment. So can I give you a couple of really practical truths? And I know this is extremely simplistic, but, but believe me, we, we talk to people on a regular basis. Almost every day, people come in our office and they're struggling financially and they have this need and they didn't expect this and they need help. And Pastor Brian, man, I'd love to be involved in the work of God, but I can't because of this. So, so let me just give you a couple of pieces of incredibly simplistic advice. But if you follow it, it'll be extre extremely helpful. The first is this, avoid debt. Avoid debt. Americans are now spending at a record 
pace. The average right now, the average credit card, family credit card debt in our country right now is $8,158. That's the average. That's not, that's not certain people. The average family credit card debt in our country is over $8,000. Contrary to public opinion, debt is not your friend. It's your master. Debt doesn't serve you. You become a slave to debt. Here's what the writer of Proverbs says. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, catch this, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And so if you have a lot of credit card debt, that credit card is not serving you. You're what? You're serving that credit card. You live to pay that off. You work to pay that off. Very frequently we hear people say, I wish I could do more, but I just can't until I pay off my debt. Debt enslaves you. Debt hinders you from helping others. Listen, begin. If that's you, and I know I'm speaking to a lot of people today and none of us want to admit that, but if that's you, Make a determination that 2018 are going to be different. Make a determination that you're going to sit back this year and you're going to spend less than you make. And you're going to put the credit card in a drawer and and you're not going to use it. That's that's for emergencies, but I would even recommend you get an emergency fund that you don't even have to touch that credit card and you have an emergency fund that you can use. Can I give you a personal testimony today? And this is real with me. It resonates with me because Vicki and I have lived this. Two years ago, Vicki and I went through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. I was over 50 years old. We'd always done very well financially, but we had always managed. For some reason, we thought it's no problem. We managed a certain amount of debt. We had three, four, five thousand dollars in credit card debt and we'd pay it off and we'd get it back again and we'd pay it off but we always had this debt hanging over our heads and we had no money in savings I was convicted about that we completely changed our lifestyle completely changed our lifestyle we paid over four thousand dollars of debt completely paid it off this year was able to put a lot of money in savings and guess what happened this year We had emergencies that happened this year. We had family members that died that we had to fly to. We had a refrigerator go out that we had to purchase. We had four or five emergencies. But guess what? We had the money to pay for it. I didn't get any increase in in my salary. We just sat back and said, we're going to what? We're going to manage what we have differently. I would encourage you, learn to live on a budget. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, I'm not familiar with QuickBooks. I don't know how to do any of that. I'm not either. I was actually going to bring you my budget. My budget is really simple. It's written out on a legal sheet. I write it out every single month. I write down mortgage and I write down, we have about 15 or 20 expenses, and I write down all of those expenses and write what I have to pay uh, uh, on each one. I pay half of them with my first pay and the other half with my second pay. It's the most simple thing you can imagine, but guess what it does for us? It works. It's put us in a budget. We know how much we spend on food. We know how much we spend on clothing. I actually have, so, so, so my car's leaking oil, and so on Tuesday I got to take my car into the shop to get it fixed. That used to terrify me because I didn't have money. I now have an envelope that says car fund on it, and we have money in there to pay off. So now I'm not worried about taking my car. Listen, here's what I'm saying. Be responsible. God has given you what you have. Be responsible with what God is giving to you. Uh, Dave Ramsey teaches you, spend all of your money the moment you get it. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? He doesn't say spend it foolishly, but take everything in that paycheck and designate it for something. So this is going towards our rent. This is going towards our food. This is going towards this. This is going in savings. This is going to the church. This is going everything. When I get paid, I sit down that first day and I spend every dollar of our paycheck. Some of it goes to food, some of it goes in the bank, some of it goes towards this, but everything is spent, and we know at the beginning of the month how much we're going to spend for everything else. Learn to say no 
to yourself. Here's the other thing I would add. This is deep, all right? This is deep. Save, save, save. Save, save, save. The writer of Proverbs says, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise store up choice food in olive oil, but fools gulp it down. I would encourage you, make saving a part of your budget. Vicki and I started really, really slow. We started saying, okay, man, the most we can do is $25 a month, and we're going to put $25 a month in savings. And we started doing that habitually, and little by little increased it. Practice regular saving and make it a part of your budget. Here's something else. Have an emergency fund that is untouchable. And let me describe what an emergency fund is. An emergency fund is not for, oh my word, there's a a sale on shoes down there. That's an emergency. That's not what an emergency is. An emergency is your car breaks down. An emergency is your refrigerator breaks down. An emergency is you have a family member who you'd like to, listen, set aside an emergency fund that is absolutely untouchable. I promise you, It will take stress out of your life. I promise you, it will take stress out of your marriage relationship. Do you realize, you know what the number one topic of marital fights are? You know what it is. What is it? It's finances. Finances. If you'll sit down with a budget, and listen, a budget means that it doesn't mean husbands, listen to me, it doesn't mean you sit down and tell your wife, here's what you got. You got $15 this month to spend. It means you sit down together and you work through the budget together and you agree together. I'm telling you, it will make your marriage so much easier. I told you it was going to be incredibly simple stuff, but I promise you, if you'll apply these things, it'll change the way that your finances are managed this next year. I'm going to give you one final thing, and I'm done, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper today. The final truth is this. Don't neglect the kingdom of God. Don't neglect the kingdom of God. Can I put Luke chapter 15 in context for you? All right, so, so let's take a step back and look at the book of Luke, all right? In Luke chapter 14, Jesus talks about the cost of discipleship. And he actually talks about, man, if you're going to build a building, you got to sit down first and, and, and count the cost. And he talks about what it, what it really costs us to be a disciple. If you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. In very clear, concise, and direct terms, he tells us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. In chapter 15, he talks about the compassion of the Father for the lost. Three different parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son, all of them blending together to show the fact that there is a Father in heaven who lovingly is reaching out for those who are lost. We get to chapter 16, and he talks about the use of earthly resources for the kingdom of God. Actually, the parable in verses one through nine of Luke chapter 16 is one of the most misunderstood parables and we'll deal with it at some point in the future. But I wanna end reading a few verses in Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. I'm gonna put them up on the screen. Would you follow along and allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your hearts as we read Jesus' words? Jesus says this, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? Here's what Jesus is saying. If you're not faithful in the unrighteous wealth, in the physical financial blessings that I give you, if you're not faithful in that, why in the world do you think that I would entrust you with something more valuable than even finances? 
And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your, or, or another's, who then will give you that which is your own? And here's the verse I want you to see. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Here's Jesus' words. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot do it. You either serve one or the other. And if I can be extremely direct, on this last Sunday of the year, the majority of believers in the United States are chasing after the wrong thing. We're chasing after wealth. We're chasing after the American dream. We're chasing after a, a new iPhone 10. We're chasing after the newest shoes. We're chasing after a bigger TV. We're chasing after a bigger car. Listen, there's nothing sinful about any of those things. I'm not telling you dress poor. I mean, I, I got a pair of Levi's on today and new shoes. I'm not telling you don't go out and spend anything, but I'm asking you this. What does your spending say about you? What does your spending say about what is important in your life? One 19th century preacher said this, the best way to evaluate the spirituality of most believers is not to look at their prayer journal, but to look at their checkbook and see what they're spending their money on. Everything that you have belongs to God. And the idea of the message, this is not a giving message. The idea of the message simply is this today. God has blessed you more than you and I deserve. We are one of, if not the wealthiest country on the face of the earth. The poorest person here today is wealthy according to the rest of the world's standards. God has given, God has given, God has given, and God has given. And our response, if we're not careful like the prodigal son is, I want more. I want everything that is coming to me right now. And we fail to realize what the Father wants. The reason the Father gives us an inheritance is that the Father wants a relationship with us. And God blesses us, not because we deserve it, we don't. God blesses us out of his mercy and out of his grace because you and I, as his child, he desires a personal, intimate relationship with us. And if we're not careful, we take from the Father and we neglect that which is important to the Father. We neglect the kingdom of God. Don't neglect the kingdom of God. How do we be Christmas? We worship every single day. We sit back and say, God, I, I want to live a generous lifestyle because that's the way Jesus lived. I want to love everybody, not just the people that love me. I want to love everybody. I want to believe with all of my heart and I want my beliefs to transform the way I act. And God, I want to take the little or the much that you give me and I want to be faithful with that. He who is faithful in little will be faithful in much.